Resident Evil 4 is the greatest survival horror game ever created. A game so astoundingly profound, it not only saved Resident Evil from becoming a zombie itself, but also revitalized the franchise in the process. RE4 sent shockwaves of inspiration throughout the entirety of the video game industry, and for good reason. But despite Resident Evil 4 being as great as it was, it was also one of, if not the most, controversial entry to the franchise nearly two decades later. In the sense that while it was being praised to be the best thing gamers had ever seen at that time, it was also condemned for the many criticisms subsequent RE releases faced thereafter. This video is the video where I dismantle and dissect one of the most divisive games ever made, and the greatest Resident Evil in what I'd like to call the action era of Resident Evil. So, around about sometime in the year 1999, development on Resident Evil 4 had officially begun. At that time, Capcom had a multitude of projects being developed by separate studios. Bear with me, as this may get a tad bit confusing. What we know today as RE3 was at that time called Resident Evil 1.5, a game that was in development that told a story set in between the events of RE1 and RE2. But following Sony's announcement of the PlayStation 2, and with Resident Evil 3 being Capcom's biggest project at that time, RE1.5 was rebranded as Resident Evil 3, whereas the original RE3 would then become Resident Evil 4. Eventually, the game wound up being a temporary GameCube exclusive for almost a year, then ported to the PlayStation 2, and thereafter, ported to infinity and beyond. For now, we will only explore Resident Evil 4 from the lens of the Ultimate HD edition on PC, as it is effectively the same game that released all those years ago on PS2. The story of Mikami committing harakiri and threatening Capcom execs with sentiments such as, if you want to do that, you can do that but you'll have to fire me first, will all be explored later, along with the very bizarre and ridiculous story of RE4's ports another time. So for now, let's get back to RE3, I mean RE4. As of now, most observers would credit the end product of RE4 as the handcrafted masterpiece of Shinji Mikami, but the truth goes far beyond that. Since the rework that followed the cancellation of the first RE2 build, fan dubbed today as Resident Evil 1.5, Mikami was in most cases absent in the director's seat in most of classic Resident Evil. Initially, the directorial role was helmed by Hideki Kamiya. By that time, both the higher ups and internal developers widely understood that Resident Evil had started to get stuck in a very repetitive gameplay loop. I played tons and tons of classic fixed camera RE and I would wholeheartedly agree. According to producer Hiroyuki Kobayashi, by that point in the series, zombies were simply no longer scary to players. Zombies were an extremely innovative enemy for horror games since their initial use in RE1, but with many years and releases later, they became more akin to cannon fodder than that of an actual fear-inducing threat. Which is why I explain that despite Joel's ability to shred zombies like a can of raid does mosquitoes, Nemesis was the reason RE3 was still a scary game, all things considered. Stars, stars. The next mainline entry to the series needed to be a radical breath of fresh air. And that radical breath of fresh air would be one of many bold attempts to take the series in a new direction, starting with Kamiya-san.
Kamiya's original gameplay vision for RE4 was more or less focused on maintaining the player's sense of feeling cool and stylized, while the story would revolve around a young Tony, investigating the mysteries surrounding his supernatural abilities. Kamiya had also felt his emphasis on style and coolness would have not worked using pre-rendered backgrounds, and as such, fully rendered 3D environments had been the decision for the next mainline entry. With the exception of 3D environments, Capcom felt these changes deviated the series too far from what it was known for. And as fellow YouTuber Foxcade put it, Ironic considering where it was going. This build would then be discarded but not scrapped just as of yet, for it would then become the foundation for what is known as the Devil May Cry series. Though it's an entire story in it of itself, that's how DMC became its own unique identity. Although DMC had successfully began a new, action-packed hack-and-slash franchise, RE3 still needed its mainline sequel. The director for the next adaptation of RE4 would be Hiroshi Shibata. The setting would feature castles and ruins of such, with an emphasis on a black fog-like enemy. This version would come to be known as the castle or fog version. The fog version would see an infected Leon infiltrating Umbrella's headquarters somewhere around in Europe with a mysterious power within his arm. The story would also explore the progenitor virus and Umbrella founder, Oswald E. Spencer. Leon would later cross paths with a mysterious woman along with a dog-like B.O.W. companion while exploring the setting and gameplay would also feature some first-person elements. However, just like the first build and the debacle leading to the release of Devil May Cry 1, some sources state a similar situation occurred with the Fog version and the release of Haunting Ground. While I won't dive too deep into this tangent, given that I do not have trusted sources, I'm simply stating if that were to happen twice, something had to be in the water over at Capcom Studios. Because based on Haunting Ground's reception, it was a fairly good game to say the least. Despite being around about 40% complete at that time, Capcom had not given the Fog version the green light and development would yet again be restarted on RE4. Biohazard 4 Prior to what is now known as the Hookman version, Certain elements from the Fog version had remained intact with later developments. Leon both remained infected and the protagonist, all else was once again being overhauled. It's here whereby we can start to discern that RE4 was the combined product of what worked with its cancelled bolds and Mikami's new direction, though we'll explore more on that later. The Hookman version would then be revealed at Capcom's E3 2003 presentation. After a short monologue by Mikami, we would then see Leon taking on various threats in a bluish, paranormal shift in reality. Such threats included dolls, suits of armor, and the infamous Hookman enemy. This was also the first rendition of the over-the-shoulder shooter camera. Although it may have seemed minimal at that time, the over-the-shoulder camera would have a profound effect not only on third-person shooters, but gaming in its entirety. And while it may seem a wild take, the changes to supernatural horror, as opposed to the traditional RE scientific elements, would have been too far of a departure from the series, despite the wild shift seen in action in the final build of RE4. Of the many things that seemed promising with the advent of the Hookman version, the game proved to be too costly for development on the GameCube, and it was still being found to lack that specific RE spark in its design according to Capcom's superiors. And as such, Mikami was the last resort for the directorial role and the final build of Resident Evil 4. But for Capcom, crunch time had hit. <laughs> With 
With three cancelled builds, the fear of discontinuation, and a struggle to find the right formula for moving Resident Evil forward, Mikami was pulled in as a last resort to direct RE4. Mikami had to act both drastically and fast in order to save the franchise. With multiple iterations scrapped, the team finally found the right direction to push the series forward. Specifics from each version, such as Leon as the protagonist and the over-the-shoulder perspective, were set in stone, and the last hurdle to cross were zombies. Going back to Kobayashi's son's statement of them not being scary anymore, I could see why Capcom had rejected the prior versions. When something frightening becomes known, the terror surrounding it lessens, and as such, it will almost always likely lose their fear factor in the process. And eventually, the team settled on the Ganados, enemies in between that of zombies and humans. Not quite human, not quite zombie. While still able to mindlessly kill, but still hold the capacity to use equipment and follow orders. With ditching zombies came with it new settings and different kinds of horror. Resident Evil was no longer a chessboard filled with zombies and puzzles. With the advent of RE4, it became a maze of tension and death. However, in development time never came without its fair share of criticisms. After Mikami had run a few in-studio beta tests, he was met with some harsh feedback from his fellow developers. Mikami-san recounted having to read through two pages filled with sentiments such as This is not Resident Evil and others such as I'll never allow this game to happen. While such takes on the new direction of Resident Evil were somewhat reasonable, I would still submit that absolutely everything that could have been done with zombies, tank controls and fixed camera angles had already been exhausted to their fullest extents. Resident Evil 4's finalization had come down to a double-edged sword and had remained just that nearly 20 years later. A game that has been released into oblivion and beyond and is seen as the title that saved Resident Evil but may have irreparably damaged survival horror forever. From the beginning, Resident Evil 4's attempt to push the series into a new direction is strongly felt. Leon's intro monologue essentially wraps up the entirety of almost everything the previous games had explored in the franchise. With Raccoon City destroyed and Umbrella finished, the only thing that tied RE4 to Resident Evil's larger continuity as a whole was Leon and his associated past of slaughtering zombies and B.O.W.s. Finding himself in an undisclosed rural part of Europe, the new style of Resident Evil is even further exemplified by the shift in camera perspective. As much as I adore the fixed camera angles of classic RE, the over-the-shoulder perspective was the best camera decision considering the type of game Mikami was intent on going for. Fixed camera angles will always be the superior in building tension and creating an eerie atmosphere. But classic RE had already explored all that could have been done with them. Resident Evil 4 had been designed to place the focus on action and the intense combat that came with it. The over-the-shoulder perspective would then perfectly lend itself with needing to shoot enemies in various sections to varying results and would also provide the player with a full view of any incoming threats. Only this time, they weren't zombies. Players found themselves facing enemies that still had the intent of tearing the player's head off, but this time they could plan, they could ambush, and as such, their threat was greatly magnified and amplified. After outlasting a horde of Ganados, Leon would then be left in the same position as the player with a great question. Where's everyone going, and how in the hell is this Resident Evil? Good sir? I don't believe the 4 was left out unintentionally though. RE4 was faced with the danger of having the series discontinued had it not done well critically and commercially. 
instead of the title being shown as Resident Evil 4, it only states Resident Evil. As in, this is the new form of Resident Evil this point onward. With the shift towards action in RE4, a simple aim and shoot mechanic would have needed to be expanded given the change in camera. Instead of aiming and pressing fire, players would now need to attack enemies in certain sections to use combat to its fullest potential. What's interesting is how specifically the Ganados react to being shot in certain areas and which action they were doing at said time of being shot. Up until RE4, most enemies in Resident Evil and action games in general would have a very basic reaction to taking damage. This time, however, enemies would have much more realistic reactions to being attacked. Running enemies would trip had they been shot in the legs. Ledged enemies could buckle and fall if shot at. And a shot to the head or knees would leave them open for a kick or more accurately, the infamous Leon S. Kennedy Roundhouse. While some may consider the kick to be overpowered, I would beg to differ. The kick attack is best used as a means to open space should the player feel cornered. Apart from close melee encounters, the action button, or should I say QTEs, quick time events, was a unique way Resident Evil 4 increased the open-ended nature of enemy encounters. You could play Resident Evil 4 for years on end, and trust me, I'm a testament to this. But the many mid-combat QTEs will always affect how differently fighting enemies could play out as, whether that be kicking ladders, dodging swings, or preemptively counter-attacking BOWs. While it may be a unique way to increase interactivity during gameplay, QTEs were also extended into cutscenes as well, during which the player could still die if they did not react in time. My buddy had a very sad story of him putting down his controller during the Salazar knife throw, and boy was my boy very quickly reminded that cutscenes in RE4 was not only for enjoying spectacle. One character in particular that elevates the scenery from being a downtrodden mess is the merchant or merchants. The merchant characters are placed within strategic points to make sure players are ready for the next wave of Ganado Swarms. With being both memorable and extremely useful, the arsenal they provide is also a great way to ensure replayability, which I'll explore more on sometime later. But as of now, just know that he is clearly neutral in this mess and is making sure to profit that both sides are equipped in carrying out their respective missions. Got some rare thing. What are you selling? The many different enemy types were also a surefire way to keep players from boring should Ganados eventually become cannon fodder. And this is another area that RE4 does exceedingly well. Each enemy with their accompanying forms of terror was all uniquely designed to fit the shooter style gameplay while simultaneously filling players' hearts with racing palpitations. With almost every enemy, many layers of dangers were added to encountering them. For many years, RE has emphasized that headshots were the most effective ways of dealing with enemies. This time, a headshot could result in a more severe threat to deal with instead. Zombie dogs shouldn't be allowed to survive long, as they would soon sprout a swarm of tendrils to shred players and players should be extra responsive when fighting Novistordes, as failing to kick in time would result in both damage and displacement. And the two enemies which I believe are the hallmark of RE4 are the Garados and the Regenerators. With Garados being unable to see, they only track the player down with actions such as running and shooting. In these fights, every single step counts, and with Ganados around, fighting them becomes a true nightmare realized. And the Regenerators simply turn everything the game taught the player up until first encountering them absolutely directly on its head. Shooting Regenerators do not stop them, and worst of all, targeting its legs basically becomes a death sentence.
Sometime later, players will get access to a more reasonable means of killing them besides emptying magazines. Before that point however, stay far away and do not, for the love of all that's good in the world, aim for the legs. What even makes them more terrifying are their subtle breathing noises. Despite action being the focus, RE4's sound design also lends itself extremely well into building tension. That goes for the mouth breathing regenerators, growling BOW dogs, and the distant rumbling of Dr. Salvador's chainsaw. On top of that, the various in-game soundtracks are seamlessly well put together to solidify the tension and action-driven experience. Here's my best few picks of the soundtrack, but before you listen to them, follow some steps if you will. Step 1. Make sure you are home alone. Step 2. Close the drapes and lock the doors. Step 3. Turn off the lights. Step 4. Set the volume to maximum and press play. And step 5. Return to me with your unsettling experiences in the comments. You all done? We can continue? Let's go. Previous Resident Evils found players in very relatable settings such as alleys and office buildings. RE4 puts players in wide, expansive and desolate, barely maintained rural areas and castles. As much as they are expansive, the game tends to very much reward players for their exploration. Having played RE4 so many times, I was genuinely shocked at how much in-game content is optional this time around. And that goes for enemy encounters certain areas, and even cutscenes. Let's take a look at one for example. Before crossing the lake, we see Ganados feeding a mysterious monster in the lake with the body of one of the police officers. This entire cutscene is optional. However, after having seen it, crossing that lake became much more terrifying. Thinking about how in the world is Leon, or even the player, ever going to bring down such a behemoth. And I truly think Del Lago is one of the most tension-inducing boss fights in the entire game. Most of the bosses follow the same unique formula of the protagonist witnessing a mutation and having to destroy them thereafter, but some of RE4's bosses are downright terrifying. The Lake Monster, Village Chief, and Verdugo are all built up in such menacing ways, in that having to finally face them the fight is paced to the T with the aforementioned use of great environment and soundtrack design. Boss fights require players to quickly react and be extremely quick to respond to incoming attacks. They are truly truly a masterpiece in execution in every sense of the word. With RE4 surpassing expectations in almost every aspect of gameplay, there's a few more things I'd like to talk about before we proceed to story. And those two parts are details and replayability. Replayability in most cases would be pretty much self-explanatory. Beat the game, start over with your previous equipment, and repeat. But RE4's difficulty system and plentiful unlockables makes replaying the game a truly fun experience had you already seen it all and done it all. Easy and normal mode? has a hidden difficulty system that scales to how good the player is at the game. 
consistent headshots and evading damage will have Ganados acting much more aggressive and evasive. And on top of that, enemies would spawn in more locations as well. But if it proves to be more challenging, enemies would steady themselves and spawn less frequently. You also have your standard unlockable game modes, costumes and weapons as game completion rewards. However, this time, costumes would also have varying effects. For example, Leon would readjust his hat instead of reloading the Chicago typewriter. Ashley's night costume will be too heavy to have enemies carry her away. And on another note, she won't cover up if Leon aims at... Uh, if he aims at... Uh, he... You guys know what I'm talking about, man. Let's, let, let's continue. And another added layer of detail is the various enhancements of the fully upgrading weapons. Many of them have varying special effects to make gameplay much more interesting. But if I stayed on details and replayability too long, that would require another video on its own, to which I'll link in the description. But professional difficulty is one that needs to be talked about to an extent. With all the danger that RE4 possesses, it's far from downright frustrating to play. Most enemies are very capable of killing you on normal or easy difficulty, and otherwise on easy mode, some areas are cut off entirely. But professional mode takes all the terror the lower difficulties could possibly muster and multiplies them multiple folds. The difficulty scaling system is always set to maximum and enemies have much more health and damage. With the limited ammo drops, players will constantly be finding themselves on edge whether or not to engage enemies or run to the next level. For anyone wanting to experience the best possible fear and tension inducing gameplay RE4 has to offer, I would strongly recommend it at professional difficulty. With all of its mind clenching close calls, roundhouse kicks and shotgun sprays. I've obtained an object that resembles a cult group's insignia. Wonderful. I'm sure some of you might be tired of hearing it by now, but just in case you never heard me say it before, Resident Evil games had never ever had a strong suit in the storytelling department. For most of the series, it was just surviving through hordes of zombies and learning about what caused the consecutive downtrodden series of events our protagonists have found themselves in. Though I must give credit where credit is due though. Some entries were able to capture some level of emotional drive to understanding the story, but unfortunately, this was not the case for most of the franchise up to this point. And while I won't go as far to say RE4's story is some mind-blowing artistic companion to its gameplay counterpart, it certainly was a greater attempt at making Resident Evil seem more serious to players. Well, at least when the characters weren't speaking. So, uh, after you take me back to my place, how about we do some, um, overtime? <laughs> Sorry. Contrary to popular belief, I don't believe RE4's dialogue is miles above the cringe-inducing speech the earlier Resident Evils were known for. Sure, someone could make a compilation on Leon literally roasting everyone, which I may have done, in the description. However, if this was meant to be some revolutionary take on action and horror, these dialogue lines surely never did the trick of conveying any of that. All they were was an attempt on making the characters look as badass or as annoying as possible. And unfortunately, this is where I finally discovered that Leon and Ada could never work. Leon's personality and mindset is... Sorry, but following a lady's lead just isn't my style. And while A does is... But I don't like it when men play rough. Cutscenes are for the most part well directed and they do a fantastic job of highlighting the stage of Leon's rocky rescue mission. The plot of Resident Evil 4 is quite simple. Umbrella gets destroyed, Leon took a promotion, the US president's daughter gets kidnapped, and Leon finds himself in what many presume to be a rural part of Spain against some viciously armed aggressors. 
Very quickly does he learn that there is something really wrong with these villagers and the predicament he found himself in. The rest kicks itself into overdrive with Leon navigating the village shrouded in mystery and rescuing Ashley. Learning of the reason why the locals are infected while taking refuge in an ancient castle, and finally finding himself on an island where the Ganados are armed to the teeth, and Ori 4 soon very becomes an all out action shooter fest. Now the question lingers, how everything in the simple story conveyed through the game's storytelling holds up. Honestly, some parts may come across as a drag to some and others may find the pacing weird as hell, but most will find RE4's story being a not worthy experience at the very end of the day. Sure, the dialogue may not be the very best, but the way the gameplay atmospherically sets everything up is what sells it in the end. With the strong introduction to the mysterious Ganados, most, if not all, would be glued to wanting to find out what's exactly happening in this desolate part of Europe. And with enough attention and reading, you'll find yourself with a very slowly built but interesting story as to why all of this is happening and how Leon will get out with his and Ashley's heads still intact. And I will admit that toward its end, the way RE4 essentially turns into an action movie gameplay wise, the exact same thing happens story wise. I mean, even Sadler admits it for crying out loud. The American prevailing is a cliché that only happens in your Hollywood movies. Eventually though, it all wraps up just like every other Resident Evil beforehand. A big explosion and a safe ride home into the distance. My only hope is that all the merchants made it out in time, because those guys really came in handy. While Resident Evil's 4 New Direction was well received on most ends, there was also a significant majority that never accepted it for what it was and found themselves as vicious detractors of the game, and for good reason. While I won't get into the negative reviews of RE4 because that's not really what I do on my videos, I will concede that I understand the point said detractors came from. Resident Evil pioneered the survival horror genre in the late 90s. It gave gamers something to both be afraid of and dispatch with a generous effort. Along the years, it built a very well established image of what itself and survival horror should look like, but a sobering reality had begun to hit very quickly. And that reality was that it could not have survived as long as its crafted image for too long and it had to change. Maybe some gamers felt the change in camera was a partial removal of Ori's original identity, Maybe some gamers missed the detailed Ori puzzles that took away swathes of their hours. Maybe some gamers felt the shift in action took it too far away from its creepy, atmospheric gameplay classic Ori was known for. And the list would go on and on for a multitude of reasons. However, as someone who treasures classic Resident Evil as much as the next fan, I wouldn't write those negative critiques off as unjustified. But I'm just too satisfied with what Resident Evil 4 turned out to be. And while RE4 may be blamed for the lack of spark in RE's action era, Resident Evil 4 itself could still be a great game in its own right if we just remove it from the larger RE continuity. And that's something I believe for Resident Evil 5, and that is something I believe for Resident Evil 6, but those are discussions for another day and another video. Somehow I knew you'd say that, but it doesn't hurt to ask, you know? So, who was that woman anyway? Why do you ask? Come on, tell me. She's like a part of me I can't let go. Let's leave it at that. <laughs>